Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. For he is worthy to be praised. And we don't have palms here. So why don't we have palms on a Palm Sunday? I don't know. I don't guess. Know. You have to get them from somewhere else because we don't have palms going around here, I guess. But it's really interesting, you know, the things that I read when I read scripture and there's different uh, uh, writers or the, the gospel synoptic writers that write different accounts of what happened. And as I read from one to one, you know, I, I have to kind of remember what one uh, author will say as opposed to the other author. And, um, I, I noticed that, you know, one author would say that he came on a colt. One of them says that there's a colt and a donkey. And, of course, the Isaiah passage says there's a donkey, a colt, and a fowl. And, and, and so, you know, you, 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 critics, of course, want to say, well, they're all wrong. Or they, they uh, contradict each other. But, you know, it's really interesting the, the way the Bible is written. And... Uh, of course, the Bible always is truth, and you have to believe that, that it, that it does not contradict, and it does make sense if you um, put it all together and uh, understand that God's Word is always true. And I'd like to start off by, um, you know, this conference was, was just awesome for me, and it, it talked about how um, in our life, you know, when, when Jesus came to the earth, he came to be glorified, and God did glorify His Son. And you remember when Jesus first started out His ministry, what, what did He do? He went to the Jordan, right? And John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God who took, takes away the sin of the world, right? And He was baptized, and when He came out of the water, what happened? The Spirit of God, through a dove, rested on Him, and there was a voice from heaven that said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. And he, and there was another time, right, on the on the mountain. It was like a camping experience, right, on the mountain top experience, and and the, the inner circle. And they thought, oh, this is awesome, you know. I want to let's let's just camp out here. And you know, those of you who've been to church camp before knows that you know we you know what the mountain top experience is, right? You have a great time, you're around all Christians, and, and you don't have the temptation of the world because you just focus on praising God. But you know what? At the end of the week, you gotta go back down from the mountain and face the everyday trials, right? But on that mountain top experience, remember again, there was uh Moses and Elijah and Jesus there, and you know, they said, let's build a tabernacle for these guys, you know? And, and, and then there was a voice from heaven, this is my beloved son. What else? Hear him. Listen to him. Hear him. And it's really important that we understand that God, through Jesus Christ, was, came to this earth so that he would be glorified. And I like that song that we sing sometimes, in my life, Lord, be glorified. You see, God wants to be glorified through us and the way we live our lives. So think about it as, as we go into this lesson. Is, is God being glorified through the way I live my life? Of course, if you're living just the way of the world, God cannot be glorified in that. In fact, um, it just does the opposite, I think. Especially if you call yourself a Christian, right? And you go into the world, and maybe the most important part is at your home. And if you're a different person in church and you look all, you know, holy and righteous and, and praising God, and at home you're treating your family like dirt, is God glorified? No. And so the thing that we need to understand is that we, in our lives, and last week we talked about the passion, uh, using the gift that God has blessed you with for His glory. Again, you can use your gift for the devil, or you can use your gift for, for God. 
just like all these musicians, you know, there's very talented musicians, but they're wasting away the talent that God has blessed them, the desire to, to use this gifting to serve their God. And so it's either going to be used to serving God, Jehovah God, or it's going to be serving the devil. Because really, that's what's happening. There's a choice between serving God and serving the devil. And if you're not serving God with what? All your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your might, and loving your neighbor as yourself, are you really glorifying God? And the answer is no. And so if you're not glorifying God, then who are you glorifying? Well, there's only one option. You see, the thing is you can put anything in front of God and that is your God. Anything that is a priority that you place before Almighty God, and it could be your work, it could be materialism, it could be drugs, alcohol, whatever it is that you place as a higher priority in front of God, and that's who you are glorifying. And so, that's the the, the concept that I want you to understand today is in my life, Lord, be glorified. And you know the thing is that the, the people of the world are watching the church. And, and if we're glorifying God by the way we live our lives, the, 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 the community looks at us and they can appreciate those people that are living within the, the walls of this building as far as the way they fellowship with each other. But if they're constantly bickering and fighting against each other, is that, is, is God being glorified? <clears throat> and one example that Dave Parrish gave uh, in one of his talks was that um, when he was getting ready to move down to uh, Texas, he, he had this house to sell, and so he contacted the appraiser, and, and the appraiser said, well, you should sell this house for such and such. And so he put it up on the market, and he had a buyer, and, uh, the, well, actually, it was the real estate agent said he should sell it for this price. And the appraiser came, and he said, <clears throat> well, you're going to have to replace the roof first. And that was already cutting into his how much he needs to sell the house for, you know, that he's going to lose money off of that. But you know what, he said, he trusted that God was going to take care of him. And you know, what happened is the preacher said, you go down there and don't worry about it, we'll take care of it. And the whole congregation, uh, and it was a small church at that time, the whole congregation, all the men were up on the road. You know, some of them were down, passing up the shingles. And all the women, guess what they were doing? They're cooking, preparing a big meal. And they had a time of fellowship. And all the neighbors around came around and said, wow, what is going on over here? You know, God was being glorified. And you know, that church grew so fast. Because they said, you know what? I'm going to start going to that church. If you really want to know what will attract people is, in my life, Lord, in our <coughs> Church, Lord, be glorified. Amen. And the only way we can do that is reusing our spiritual gifts to glorify Him, to praise Him, and that the people that are watching us will see that we do have a God that we serve. So we, we come to this, uh, again, this time of the year when, uh, of course, we don't practice the Lent season and, the, and all the traditions, but the thing is that maybe we, we, we need to you know, think a little more to be reminded. You know, the, the Old Testament had all these festivals that the Jews, the Hebrew people had to remember what God had done for them. And I think it's good that we have Christmas time where we, we remember Christ, and it shouldn't, it shouldn't be just twice a year that we remember. I mean, there's people that are churchgoers twice a year, Easter and Christmas, right? But the thing is, this should be something that we remember every day of our lives, but it's good to have a, a, a festival just like the Jews had a festival 
so that we can remember what Jesus did for us. So I want to read the account of the triumphal entry. It says in John 12, and again I see there's several different writers that give the eyewitness account of what happened, uh, but John was an apostle, so he was right there. So this is a, a first-hand account. It says, the next day the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, and he took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And blessed is the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming. See it on a donkey's coat. So this was something that was prophesied years before by the prophet Isaiah. He said that, that the Messiah will come, and he's going to come sitting on a donkey. Now, what, what is your concept of a donkey and a person riding on a donkey? Or why did Jesus choose a donkey? Well, you know, they, they say that the donkey, uh, someone coming riding on a donkey was a sign of coming in peace. And one thing that was pretty interesting that a lot of, uh, like Elton Shuba says in his Humor of Christ book, that there, there's a little humor there because uh, how many of you, um, Bob uh, Whitlock knows about riding on a colt that has never been ridden before? How many of you would like to get on a horse or a mule or a donkey that has never been ridden before? What's going to happen? You're going to get thrown off. But you know, you, Jesus... He has the control over everything, right? Over nature, over the animals. And he said that he will sit on this donkey and bring in peace. Of course, you know, you know the Roman government and you know the Jewish people, the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. They didn't want, in fact, when the, this whole scene plays right after Jesus resurrected Lazarus from the dead and, and people were excited. Because now the Messiah has come, and they'll, he will overthrow the Roman government, and he would, um, they would not be oppressed anymore, and the Jews will rule the world. So they're out there with these palm branches, and they're singing out, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Our Messiah has come finally. And of course, you see in this corner over here, those Sadducees and the Pharisees, you know, they're kind of disgusted because now they're going to lose their their uh, rule of the people, their authority. And so they're getting all jealous and they start conniving and scheming. How are we going to get rid of this guy? <laughs> it says, as first his disciples they didn't understand all this and only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that all these things had been written about him and that these things <coughs> had been done to him. And now the crowd was with him uh, when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to spread the word. Many people, uh, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. And so the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. And you know, the thing is that, do you see a little jealousy here? Do you see a little pride here with uh, religious leaders? And you know, the thing is, the, the very thing that brought Satan down was the thing that rules in the hearts of men and women today. That they think that they know it all, that they can control people and do things their way instead of God's way. In 1 Corinthians 9, says, Paul says, Though I am free and belong to no one, I leave myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. How many people can you win? You know, we don't know how many people we're going to win to the Lord, but you know, we got to sow the seed, we've got to cast it out there, and then let the people make the decision whether they want to turn to God or not. And if we don't speak, if Christians don't speak boldly the word of God, how else are they going to hear the message of Christ and what they've done for us? We need not to be selfish about what, 
we have learned, you know, keep it to ourselves. Again, I'm, how many times I hear that excuse, you know, people say, well, I can, I don't need to go to church. I can stay at home. I can read my Bible. I can pray. But that is benefiting who? Just you. And the thing is, when people are absent from the fellowship, and that's why so many, when I, when, I, when I say, okay, it's greeting time, and it's just a joy for me to watch you guys. And you know what? Sometimes we get to the point where, you see that thing on the wall over there? I, I think we should just take it down. You know, they told me when they go to the bar, people in uh, Papua New Guinea, that if, you only, if the preacher only spoke for 10 minutes, they feel cheated. Yet, here in America, we have the freedom to worship God, and we're thinking about how long this is taking. Yeah. What do you come here for? Do you come here to just put your time in? Or do you come here to glorify God, to worship Him, and to have fellowship with each other? It says, to the Jews I became like a Jew, to win the Jews, to those under the law, because... I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am free from God's law, but I am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I have become weak. To win the weak, I have become all things to all people that I might what? Win some. You see, you don't have control over how many people is one to Christ. But our obligation is that God will be glorified through our actions, through the, the way we live our lives. This is the way we worship God, is by the way we live, by the way we display a Christ-like attitude and His character in our lives. He says, I I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I might share in its blessing. <clears throat> do you not know that in a race all the runners run? How many of you have ever been in a race before? Or maybe in high school you had track meet. What's the purpose of running? Just for the sake of running? For an exercise? Yeah. Well, you know, I don't think your coach would like it if you didn't have the desire to win. Maybe he knows that you probably won't win, but you should at least have a goal to win. Run in such a way to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the game goes into strict training. Now you can't expect to get up and, and, and have a race tomorrow and never went and practiced and running, right? In the same way, in order to compete, in this race of life, we have to practice what God has taught us in His Word. And as we practice it, we become more skilled, we sharpen our skills to become more like Christ. They do not all get a crown that will last, but I, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. You see, you know, a physical race is just something, you know, James Dawson talked about, um, Trashing our trophies, right? You know, he he was uh, doing some sport, and then one day he was at his school that he grew up in, and they were throwing away the trophy that he had won. How many people can remember what you accomplished in life? You know, after you're gone and forgotten about. It. But the thing is that if we are going to physically enter a race on earth and we do it because we want to win the race, how much more should we run this race of life and, and have a reward that will last for eternity? He says, therefore I do not run like someone running aimless, or I, don't know, I do not fight like a boxer just beating in the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself would not be disqual disqualified for the prize. And then in, in Matthew 25, Jesus talks about what we call talents. 